Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Sridham. I am from the Nudge Foundation. It's a pleasure to introduce our panelists today, uh, Kartik Desai and Aparna Dua from Asha Impact. They're here with us to present a masterclass on blended financial instruments. The floor is yours, Kartik. Great. Thank you, Sridham. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and thank you for the Nudge Foundation for hosting this incredible event, uh, bringing together so many different practitioners from the development industry. So uh, Asha Impact is pleased to be you know, uh, presenting this track on blended finance. We have a series of interesting discussions lined up over the next few days, uh, starting with a panel discussion uh, uh, amongst the three funders, a capacity uh, development discussion with experts talking about how NGOs can best be prepared to uh, raise blended finance, and uh, uh, a high level discussion with Vikram Gandhi and Shantanu Ghosh. So before we did all of that, we thought we would at least like to demystify to some extent what blended finance means. So we have a small presentation here, which uh, me and my colleague Aparna will take you through. Uh, Aparna, please, can we go to the next slide? Uh, just a very, very quick introduction to Asha Impact, uh, not to take more than two minutes on this. We are basically a combination of an impact investment platform and a policy advocacy platform. Uh, the unique thing about us is that we do uh, this for a network of Indian business leaders. So it's exclusively domestic capital from the sort of individuals that you see mentioned there. So that's basically the Asha Trust model. And our theory of change, uh, or as I said, the reason we do this is uh, because we're trying to basically achieve two things. One is uh, we are focused, at least on the impact investment side, on market-based solutions, right? So solutions which can scale with commercial capital, which may need impact investment to initially seed the innovation to de-risk the early stage model. But really the objective to create scale is to try and attract some extent of commercial capital. So that's what we've tended to do in our impact investments. And we've done this across sectors that you see there below. So we're one of those sector agnostic investors. But unlike the classic impact investors, like I said, we also have this not-for-profit, uh, this uh, think tank, uh, the Asha Impact Trust, which has been trying to really build the overall market for impact investment, working on policy advocacy in specific social sectors with the government, with state governments and national governments. And probably most critically, trying to enable blended, blended finance. So what really is blended finance? Uh, let, us, let us get into that. Uh, so the classic uh, you know, blended finance tool is what is usually known as an impact bond. Uh, before we jump into the slide, I just want to step back for a second and just mention that, look, blended finance, what it essentially, it means different things to different people, right? Some people call it pay for success. Some people call it results-based financing, RBF. Right. So the, this is a conceptual way of talking about finance, uh, which is you have philanthropic capital, which is non return seeking capital, and you've got commercial capital. When you bring the two of them together, that's basically blended finance. So it's how do you bring together capital creatively, philanthropic capital, debt capital or equity capital. OK, so social impact bonds or development impact bonds are an example of this, of what of, uh, you know, of, of a financial instrument. Uh, to achieve this outcome. So this uh, slide tries to sort of explain what, it, what a social impact, what development impact bond is. I'll try to explain it to you as simply as possible. Essentially, a development impact bond is a way of financing social service delivery. So think about currently, if the government does this, uh, let's say they have to build a hospital or they have to build a school, there's a certain outlay and a certain outcomes associated with that. Now imagine instead of the government doing it, you have a private party doing that, an NGO or a for-profit social, uh, social enterprise. That's what's known as a service provider. So the service provider carries out a certain intervention. That intervention is funded by risk capital, right? Which is the initial capital that it costs to provide that intervention. Whatever is the outcome or the outputs of that intervention are independently measured by the outcome funders or, or rather by the independent evaluators who share that information with the outcome funders. And if the service provider has been successful in delivering uh, the outcomes that have been targeted, then the outcome funders pay back the risk capital. Sounds very co complex, but essentially it's a way of, you know, deferring the payment for outcomes on the part of the outcome funder, right? Uh, for, the, for, for, the, for the risk capital, it's, it's entirely brand new. So you're essentially creating a new class of philanthropists because earlier you just had the philanthropist giving money to the service provider. So think of an impact bond as essentially a way for the outcome funder to leverage his or her capital, right? By crowding in all this additional capital from risk capital. And also this risk capital, these investors are focused not just on giving their money, but because that money is at risk, 
doing the due diligence and the performance management to ensuring that the likelihood of the intervention is, uh, is, is, is high. So this is a little bit about, you know, what impact bonds are. We wanted to make sure that, you know, folks understood this. Um, just moving ahead, uh, Aparna, in terms of the global impact bond market and the, and the market in India, there's a lot of research uh, which has come out on this over the last uh, few years, right, uh, with the increasing attention on this space. So this is the, uh, we've sort of tried to summarize all of that. So, 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 so what do we see here? In total, there have been about 185 impact bonds that have been launched. Okay, but the vast majority, all except maybe, uh, I think 17 or 18, have been in developed countries. So that's the first important thing to keep in mind, that this was really something that was pioneered in the United Kingdom and has been implemented in the United States, in Australia, and only in the last couple of years, you've started to see this happening in developing countries. And of course, there's fundamental differences there. For example, look at the average beneficiaries. In a developed country, it's about 12,000, which is not that high. Uh, the average size of a bond has been about 3 million. And because it often takes time and cost to set up these bonds, that has been one of the uh, criticisms of, of, of bonds that say in developed markets, that it has sometimes been more expensive uh, relative to the number of people who are reached. But of course, when we talk about doing impact bonds in developing countries, that changes considerably. The costs go down and the outreach go up. So if you just go to the next slide, uh, you'll see that. That in the developing world, what is the situation with impact bonds? So as we said, there's about 17 total bonds. Uh, uh, SIDS are, of course, where the government is the sponsor. That's a social impact bond. And a development impact bond means where a philanthropist replaces the government. You can see that India technically has the most uh, three bonds, which are active bonds, which are in the market, which have been closed. This does not include more than, I would say, up to a dozen or so bonds, which are currently in various stages of development, which is the most that we've seen uh, in any country. So India really is at an inflection point now, and we're seeing a lot more of these things happening. And of course, what we're going to talk about is the relevance of, of development impact bonds, specifically in the post-COVID world, uh, you know, once, once we have sort of covered some of these basic building blocks. And just in case folks aren't aware, uh, you have the three bonds which are currently in the market, just to quickly recap. The first one is a single provider, uh, DIB, which is in education, which is in Rajasthan, with an NGO called Educate Girls. This bond has already closed and it has uh, you know, been very successful. And it's specifically focused on an NGO in Rajasthan, which is working to bring out of school girls into school and improving their learning outcomes in the school. Utkrisht uh, and the Quality Education Dib are both multi-provider dibs. In other words, you've got, in the case of Utkrisht, four or five healthcare service providers. And in the uh, case of the Quality Education Bond, three or four uh, education providers. You've got risk capital, which has been mobilized by folks, uh, principally by UBS Optimus Foundation. Uh, and Dhan is you know, going to be joining us for the panel. So H&Is have funded these interventions uh, according to agreed outcomes. And as and when, and each year, these NGOs meet their targets, uh, they get funding for the next year. And if they're unsuccessful, then, uh, you know, then, then, then that intervention is discontinued. And broadly, you can see in terms of the areas where these bonds have been most active, this is across emerging markets. Uh, you've seen five or so in healthcare, five or so in employment, and three of them in education. So this is broadly in terms of the market overview. And, and, uh, and finally, and then I'll hand it over to, you know, to, to Aparna. Uh, why do we use development impact bonds? There's basically you know, four reasons. Number one, impact bonds drive efficiency and efficacy in the, in the spending of precious philanthropic dollars, right? Because they essentially allow uh, philanthropists to only pay in the event of success and to crowd in additional capital and also to sort of, you know, build the larger development ecosystem and create the right incentives for, for the, uh, all the various parties and measure that this intervention is being done more cost effectively than the alternative. So that is a principal reason why you know, philanthropists are interested in this. The second reason is that it crowds in and brings in new types of philanthropists, which we're calling risk investors. Risk investors are the folks who give the upfront money where they get some return paid out by the outcome funder philanthropists. So for them, think about it this way, like impact, a classic impact investor, like Asha Impact or any impact fund, it's an opportunity to create much deeper impact than classic impact investing, albeit at more moderate returns. 
uh, and you get to recycle that capital, which is something very, very interesting for many philanthropists. So that's the second reason. Thirdly, for the NGO, it allows the NGO to be a lot more efficient and flexible. The NGO or the, source, the social service provider is basically told that these are, these are the outcomes you have to deliver. And as long as you deliver them, you'll get paid. And you can tweak and adjust your approach and your methodology along the way. And it gives you that flexibility. And of course, at the end of it, you get to track what is working and what's not working, which is useful not just for that NGO, but for the larger development ecosystem and figuring out, uh, you know, what, what interventions work, what don't, quantifying how much they work, and even being able to price that, that for being able to deliver this many units of impact, this is how much uh, financial incentive that should be equivalent to. So this is some of the important reasons why impact bonds we feel are very, very important and why we've seen them scaling up uh, substantially. Great, thanks Karthik. And um, I think maybe where I'll pick up from is just to kind of emphasize, you know, because um, given today's webinar, we're talking about how can we all really come together, uh, you know, pool resources um, to really, uh, you know, a, drive an action plan for COVID and also kind of, you know, chart that post COVID world together. <laughs> I think the point on um, having complete flexibility on program delivery is an important one. And we'll also kind of be discussing that in more detail with a couple of experts tomorrow morning at 11. So please do, you know, join in for that as well. But um, really, I think to take, take the discussion forward from where, uh, you know, Karthik left off. Now, we do have about 180 odd bonds, uh, you know, globally, as he mentioned. And, um, you know, there is evidence supporting, you know, some of the arguments and there's um, sort of lack of evidence, you know, on a couple of other things. So quickly, you know, what are those key points? I think as Kartik mentioned, it's driving, um, you know, a lot of collaboration between different parties, whether that's investors, whether that's, um, you know, consulting companies that act as program managers, the service providers themselves and government, so, since you're always sort of working, you know, with um, government as, as a provider. So there is evidence that it's supporting collaboration. It's bringing about a deeper focus on outcomes, which is very, very different from how uh, some of the interventions have been focused in the past, you know, more sort of input driven or activity driven. This really sort of squarely brings the attention of all parties involved onto achieving those outcomes. Uh, again, tying into that previous point that we were making about offering complete flexibility to service providers, right? So everyone's working to achieve, say, an increase in learning outcomes and the pathways to getting there may be different. Uh, you're deploying strong program management uh, as well so that you're constantly getting feedback on how you're doing on the ground, whether the intervention is working or not. Uh, and in that sense, sort of building a culture of monitoring and evaluation, um, so those are where, you know, there is sufficient evidence when we look at, uh, you know, impact bonds globally. Now, some of the other claims that have been made for impact bonds that you would have heard are, uh, you know, it's supporting experimental interventions or it's crowding in a lot of private funding. Now, while that may not really be the case um, globally, um, or there isn't enough evidence to support it rather. In India, at least, we're seeing some, you know, promising signs of that, which is great. Um, you know, specifically, if one were to look at the example of Waterfield Advisors, they've been able to mobilize domestic capital for an agri dip, uh, uh, for the dip in agriculture, which is meant to hit the market in a, in a couple of months. And similarly, as you know, Karthik mentioned earlier in the West, um, you know, we've only had beneficiaries, you know, in, in a couple of thousand. But in India, both, um, you know, the healthcare dip as well as the quality education India dip um, have, you know, two lakh and six lakh beneficiaries. So there's, um, you know, there's clearly good and strong evidence coming from India. And there is that, that focus on scale, which is great. Um, you know, just looking at what data is available on the success rate of impact bonds as well. So uh, we only have, uh, you know, data for about 47 uh, of, the, of the 185 bonds that are out there. Um, and of that, it's, it's pretty promising because, you know, 50% uh, of those have returned positive uh, returns, which is great. And, uh, you know, as and when more data comes in, uh, we hope that, you know, using this evidence space, we can continue to grow the space of impact bonds and blended finance overall as well. And then lastly, I don't think a discussion on impact bonds would be, um, you know, complete without actually discussing what are really the challenges? We've talked about how the market is at an inflection point. Uh, 
but um, I think it's worth sort of spending a couple of minutes talking about what are the challenges to scaling up as well, right? I mean, if you look at a decade of impact bonds globally, we, we only have about 400 odd million that's been um, catalyzed or mobilized in terms of capital. So why is that really the case, right? So we've seen a um, couple of challenges. One is with the, the funding itself, right? Whether it's on the outcome funding side or on the risk capital side. Now, the, for the risk capital, I mean, investors don't really see um, the return uh, on an adjusted, on a risk adjusted basis. They don't really see the returns necessarily as being attractive. So, so far, impact bonds, um, you know, we've only seen participation from uh, impact focused uh, investors. So, HNIs, family offices that do want to allocate a part of their portfolio towards impact, we've seen participation from them. Um, you know, similarly on, on metrics, and these are some of the topics that we'll go deeper into in the following chat from five to six, there isn't um, standardization of metrics, which, you know, drives up costs and often, uh, you know, leads to elongated discussions between the risk capital and the outcome funder uh, as to what is really the right price um, for a particular outcome. So given that we don't have enough standardized metrics, so this is something that can often take time. And then lastly, given the nascency of um, you know, the field itself, we've seen that these instruments in the past have taken about two to three years to structure. But again, uh, there is you know, strong evidence coming in that by templatization of some of these documents, we can actually drive down uh, the time taken to, to structure some of these bonds and also bring down the costs effectively. So those are really the challenges. And I think as and when the field grows, we will continue to see some of these being addressed and they are already um, you know, early signs of that happening. Um, with that, just to you know, conclude, um, just giving you a brief sense of where the market is. Um, you know, India, as Karthik said, has the most number of impact bonds uh, amongst the developing nations. And we can see we have a fairly robust um, market with um, you know, tons of outcome funders, risk investors, even though challenges persist, but we're seeing a fairly robust market. And of course, this is um, only meant to be illustrated because the service providers would vary uh, from, a, from any particular sector. So we'll uh, maybe open it up to a couple of uh, questions. I see a lot have poured in. Unfortunately, we may not be able to get to all, but if we can use the next maybe five, six minutes uh, to take a couple of questions. Maybe we can do that. I think I do. Uh, I've been looking at the questions and thank you very much uh, for all of them. Um, unfortunately, we've only blocked half an hour here. So we'll only be able to cover a couple of questions. But we do have a one hour session after this uh, with, like I said, the three probably leading organizations in this space, you know, uh, which is UBS, Optimus, Michael and Susan Dell Foundation and the British Asia Trust. And that is a one hour session. So please, uh, come there and we can continue to answer your questions there. Uh, and some people have asked for the presentation, so certainly we'll be happy to share that also. But uh, since we do have a few moments, I think, look, two, two important questions, you know, sets of questions have been raised. A lot of people are asking, who are impact bonds relevant for? What type of NGOs? Can an NGO raise it just to cover its operating costs? Can impact bonds be raised by social enterprises? So let's answer that. And some, a lot of people have been asking, other than impact bonds, what are the other blended finance instruments? That, that's an important question as well. So on the first question, look, it, and different people will have different perspectives on this, but an impact bond is really a scaling instrument. It's not a grant. It's not, a, you know, it's, not, it's not to cover the operating cost of trying a new intervention. But if you have an intervention which is working, and on a relative basis, you're able to provide a better outcome for a lower cost right, than the government, then that intervention deserves to be scaled, right? Let's say you're currently running uh, an educational intervention in a certain geography for, let's say, 1,000 people, and it's going really well. Ultimately, how do you scale that to, let's say, 10,000 people? Uh, so impact bonds are best suited for, uh, you know, for, for scaling. There's no reason why a social enterprise technically can't also participate in this, though, you know, because impact bonds are philanthropic, they are generally focused on NGOs, but a social enterprise could also raise that grant to a, a service contract. But it kind of links to that second question of what are other blended finance instruments other than impact bonds? Uh, and, and, and the principal category there is what are called social success notes or guarantee structures, okay, SSNs. And those are basically things having to do with uh, 
structured debt or subsidizing debt in some way. And that is most relevant to social enterprises. So think about, I'll give you a couple of quick examples uh, you know, of, of structured debt. Imagine you have a social service provider that is doing healthcare skilling for, uh, you know, for workers to train them for healthcare delivery, or you've got a, you know, a, a, a service provider that's giving income support to migrant workers who are affected by COVID who don't have incomes. So you can give them a loan, right, at a, at a low interest rate. So there the risk capital would come in and provide a loan for someone to take a skilling course or for someone to have income in their pocket until the lockdown ends and they're back in their jobs. And they pay a subsidized interest rate on that loan, anywhere from 0%, it can be a zero cost loan, to 8, 9, 10%, but much lower than the market rate that they would be charged. So the risk capital is charging that loan, right? Now, certain portion of, the, of those loans will default because those people won't be able to pay back. And the outcome funder covers that that, that default, you know, with a, with a risk guarantee. So that's another example of, uh, you know, of, of, of a blended finance structure, which is not a classical impact bond. Uh, and as you can see, that can be relevant to a for-profit or not-for-profit. So hopefully, I know that was a bit brief, but at least it gives you an example of the fact that there are many, many structures out there beyond impact bonds. And the, the, there's a tremendous relevance that many of these structures actually have uh, in the post-COVID scenario. Uh, in healthcare and in education and skilling and service delivery. So in the next session that we have, which is starting exactly in five minutes, uh, we'll actually be diving into that in detail. I'll just um, add to that, uh, you know, typically in a social success note, uh, we're basically, uh, you know, again, since we promised this to, to make this completely jargon free, uh, as long as an enterprise can, uh, you know, pay their loan or service their debt, um, they should be, you know, looking at an instrument like a social success note, where the outcome funder is really, uh, you know, providing an, a, a subvention to the loan, right? So they're minimizing the interest or minimizing the principal that the social enterprise has to pay back. Um, and typically, impact bonds would be better suited for a nonprofit that doesn't have a sustainable revenue model and are completely sort of dependent on grants. Um, there was another question about uh, how do you make impact bonds uh, suited for programs that may have uh, outcomes that are realized over a long time, maybe a decade. So I think that that's a great question. So you know, one of the key things that one has to uh, to keep in mind when you're designing an impact bond is really are uh, what are the outcomes that one is going after. They have to be. Uh, measurable, they have to be quantifiable. And if one feels that those outcomes will only get achieved over a decade, then one has to work collaboratively with the funders, with the service provider, to define intermediary, uh, intermediate outcomes that can be measured, say, over two years or three years. So, for example, in Rajasthan, the theory of change is that an accredited uh, private hospital will actually lead to better healthcare outcomes for mothers and their newborn babies. So instead of actually measuring uh, you know, birth rate or death rate, they're actually measuring accreditation um, and improved, um, uh, sort of improved accreditation for these hospitals. So you can set intermediate outputs as long as all parties involved agree and it feeds into your uh, larger theory of change, which is backed by evidence. Well done. Um, I think we've um, bucketed some of these questions that would have answered. Um, uh, Kartik, are there any other questions that um, we need to answer? Or I think we should move on to the next panel, perhaps. I think we have one more minute. If uh, Irwan asked a good question, which is, why are, the education, why, why are the devs focused so much on education? And we'll talk in much more detail about education in the next panel, but uh, other areas where devs could be relevant. Sure. Um, so thanks for that question. So yes, globally, you know, we've seen, um, as we showed in this slide as well, dibs have uh, happened, you know, in employment and social welfare, healthcare. Again, it, it comes down to the outcome funder, who's really the commissioner of the outcomes to drive this forward, um, as well as the outcomes need to be measurable, quantifiable. However, having said that, like I mentioned, we are starting to see dibs in agriculture, um, water, sanitation, so different sectors are, uh, you know, opening up to this as well. 